Welcome to the Heart of Hospitality podcast hosted by Duncan O'Rourke, CEO Accor Northern Europe. Hospitality matters because it has heart. In this series, we'll be speaking to our guests to celebrate the moments and lives that make this sector so special and to spotlight the true heart of hospitality, people. For the fourth episode of the season, Duncan is joined by Adrian and Paul Gardner, who are not only father and son, but also CEOs of Mantis, a leading conservation-focused hotel group that offers true bucket list experiences on seven continents. They share their journey, from Adrian starting with his first farm, to becoming one of the ambassadors for the preservation of wildlife, which led to projects like the Community Conservation Fund Africa, working with Bear Grylls, and the future creation of the first Big Five game reserve between two cities. In addition, they discuss their belief that as ecotourism becomes more important than ever, it is important to integrate communities, teach and raise awareness to save wildlife, and appreciate our precious planet. All right, good morning, everybody. I'm joined today by Adrian and Paul Gardner, father and son, CEOs of Mantis, which is one of the leading conservation-focused hotel groups in the world with curated hotels, eco lodges, and waterway experiences, and as mentioned, all over the world, rooted in conservation. Mantis has been offering ecotourism, safaris, and adventures for over 25 years. Uh, Paul, Adrian, thank you so much for joining us today. I've been very much looking forward to speaking with you both. And, you know, we all share a history in South Africa. I only lived there for not not a few years, but 11 years. Uh, And and my story uh, ended when I was 11, when my family relocated from South Africa back uh, to to Holland there. Um, And my mother, in fact, sent me to a boarding school in in England, in Bath, in England, uh, and was so excited that I would uh, leave that boarding school with a very English accent. And and I still have this South African accent. People always remind her and think that. But that's that's wonderful. So it's never really left you. I think you can all hear how well that went in losing that accent. And so I'm super excited. Uh, It's a wonderful country. One thing. And again, as mentioned right at the beginning, very honored and proud to be able to be speaking with you, Adrian uh, and Paul. Your story of South Africa is far more spectacular than mine, of course, and it continues to this day. Adrian, can you take us back to the beginning of the Manta story? Sure, thank you. And again, it was an absolute privilege and pleasure to meet you in London personally uh, not long ago. And I think, uh, you know, that conversation that we had sort of resonated and I think as you said earlier what made it special was that at least you did experience a number of years in South Africa. So just to give you a little bit of a brief history of my uh, short life, I'm about to turn 80, but um, anyway I was born in uh, then Northern Rhodesia and grew up in Southern Rhodesia, uh, Zimbabwe and then um, my dad was very involved in cattle ranching And just to give you an idea, one of the ranches in Zimbabwe was 365,000 acres, 150,000 hectares. And on that farm was a private game reserve. And we were quite involved growing up that he would uh, look after farms when the managers went away. So we were exposed to, call it land and wildlife, from a very early age. Then I went to school in uh, uh, just outside Bulawayo, which is in... Zimbabwe, and it was a brand new school. It was an old gold mine that my father and his friends uh, turned into a school, and uh, we were one of the first kids to go there. So I sort of grew up, and I think that's where uh, my entrepreneurial flair probably came from. Then went to the University of Cape Town, uh, where I um, studied a big Bachelor of Commerce degree, and my first job was with the Spa Group, and I think the Spa Group is pretty uh, well known through Europe. Uh, as far, and we were in the, what they called the central office. And uh, then I got offered a job by one of the people who had the spa franchise in the Eastern Cape at Port Elizabeth. And so that's when I moved to Port Elizabeth. I'd been married a year. So we came up here with my wife, a dog. Uh, my wife was pregnant and a little mini minor and joined that group. And we sold out that group in 1974. And that's when I started the journey on my own. And the journey started with building swimming pools, tennis courts, roads, and all the rest of it. And then the interesting thing is that um, the tax position in our country was that if you had 
a, a business that was not related to the business where you were making money, you could offset profits. So one of the, the, the big things was a lot of people went into farming or agriculture, and that's how I got into horses. Because a partner at that time, when I was in my crane business and in the transport business, um, he uh, was uh, loved horses, and so we started a stud farm. And then uh, we just really finished it, and we had had an incredible year in, in the horses. So our stud farm, uh, which everybody said wouldn't work, was in a place called Plettenberg Bay. And I got a call uh, up there to say somebody wants to buy your farm. So I said, not for sale. I've just really finished my home and everything. That was Thursday. By Sunday, I'd sold it. So it gives you an idea that, um, you know, everything's for sale if the price is right and you think you're doing the right thing. And that was really the, the journey when um, the, the whole conservation and mansion story began in 1989 when I bought the first farm, uh, which was degraded, drought ravaged, and abused farmland just outside Port Elizabeth. I did go back to uh, Zimbabwe and to and the traditional areas of South Africa to look for a farm because I had it in my blood that I wanted to have, have having a bit of money, just a farm for myself that I could go out for. And I realized that if I was going to do this, I had to do it close to Port Elizabeth. So I checked the history of Port Elizabeth in the area when the 1820 settlers came in. It was absolutely teeming with wildlife, including the Big Five, which we obviously know in the elephant, rhino, buffalo, cheetah, lion, and all the rest of it, leopard. And uh, it was all there. But that farm, that land became farmland. And by 1860, believe it or not, the lions were extinct in this area. So I bought the first farm, and I thought I must have it. It was about an hour's drive from Port Elizabeth. Then the next farm came, and the next farm came. And then before I knew it, I had something like 25,000 acres, 11,000 hectares. And I thought, well, I better commercialize this. So I went and looked at the other people who had done private game reserves. But then what I realized is that I could put back what was traditionally there, and that was the big five. And the big thing that we had in this area was it was malaria-free, which would be one of the first in Southern Africa where you could go on a game experience without having to take the malaria pills. So what happened was that uh, in 1992, we opened, and I didn't know much about it. And uh, then I suddenly realized that there's such a thing as a tour operator, and I had to get to understand the hospitality business. It was after 1990. For when we had, uh, you know, uh, President Mandela and democracy and everything else came in, uh, the, the, the market opened. And I then realized is that, you know, uh, we could make this into something really special. But what I've learned in life is that you need endorsements. You know, if you've got a good product, you need people to endorse it. And I'll tell you about that later. But um, you asked me, how did it come about Mantis? And it came about through one very special person in my life. And that person was Dr. Ian Player, Gary Player's brother. And just like everybody knows who uh, Attenborough is, everybody in Southern Africa knew who Player was. And this is not the golfer, this is the conservationist, because he saved the white rhino from extinction. So I got Ian Player to come and look at what I was doing. And he was really, if I can say, uh, highly motivated and intrigued. He endorsed it like no tomorrow and he introduced me to some of the top conservationists in the world who came and visited us. Then I was approached by, you know, brands that you will know. And I said to them, you know, uh, to the guys in the team, I said, why don't we create our own brand? Yeah, that's lovely. Thank you, Adrian. And that's a wonderful story from a horseman and stud farms uh, and quite a jump for a pun from horse racing to, to the conservation rhinos elephants on your, on your land there. It's just absolutely fantastic. Paul, um, what was it like to, to meet up in this incredible land, this former settlement? And it must have been an incredible impact on you at the time. And I can imagine that those experiences plotted your path uh, to where you are today. What came actually, what came first, the love of nature or the land? Sure. No, so, so while all of that was going on in 89, I think I was about 16 years old. And my brother and I were at boarding school in Grahamstown. And my parents lived in Port Elizabeth. So the, the re, one of the reasons Dad selected this little pocket of land uh, was that it was between, it was equidistant between Port Elizabeth and Grahamstown where we were boarding. And so um, the beauty of that was we could meet out there for weekends. And, you know, I had a lot of friends at boarding school that farmed locally. And they all farmed sheep, goats, and cattle, and 
and crops along the Fish River and, 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 and whatever else. But I was privileged enough to go out and spend weekends with them. Um, and, and we never had this land. Our, our land was our stud farm in Plettenberg Bay. It was a long way away. And, um, and then uh, suddenly dad purchased this farm and said, come boys, come and see what I bought. It was only a thousand hectares. Mm. Um, but it was suddenly we had our own farm. And so we could bring our mates out there for weekends, but we were doing something completely different to what they were doing, you know, which is traditional farming. We were rewilding and bringing back what had existed there. So uh, you can imagine as a young 16 year old, you know, when the first truck ar- arrived with uh, five baby elephants and then the next weekend, a few black uh, or white rhino. Um, and and uh, my, my story was far cooler than my friend's story. So um, suddenly I was the popular kid. So we, it was it was an amazing um, thing to be associated with as a youngster because obviously it triggered a journey of conservation um, for my brother and myself and um, and my sister too. So we we, we uh, you know when you when you work in conservation it's incredible what doors open for you because you obviously seem to be doing good on the for the planet which is so popular today obviously and it's so nice to be able to do and put something back. Um, because I think the DNA that we've created down there um, in the in that province has allowed us to take the DNA to all corners of the planet, which is just brilliant. So um, I think it's uh, it's it, it's a journey that's only just begun for us because we've planted the seed in Africa, and I believe we can take that DNA everywhere. That's right. And, and you know, my brother and I would love to continue that legacy and 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 the team that we've built behind us. Uh, you know, Dad's legacy is rewilding and it's becoming uh, incredibly popular around the world. And I think Mantis is at the forefront of of, uh, taking that eco tourism and sustainability model to to other parts of the world. And and that's what we're doing with our big brother, Akko. And we'll obviously go into that as dad has said. Um, But I think for me, uh, what what came first, the nature uh, piece um, or, or the land piece, I think dad will probably tell you, it, it was it was more the commercial side first, but gradually he and all of us fell in love with the nature side because you could see the benefit of what it did. You know, we started with uh, all that all that land that we acquired. I think we employed twenty people. Um, at the end of the day, when we had a successful, sustainable ecotourism game reserve, it employed at its peak almost five hundred people. So that's going from sort of transitioning from sheep, goats, and cattle to big five and, and wildlife, you could just see the impact of ecotourism um, on, on land. And that model, that business model resonated because today I think there are almost 20 other game reserves that followed the model. So they've all chucked out the sheep, goats, and cattle and switched. And today the whole province uh, is now a very popular wildlife destination. So you could just see how that was scaled and the amount of employment that result, resulted from that. Um, so again, it's a feather in dad's cap and it's the DNA of our group today, which we really want to take around the world. Yeah, that's fantastic. And of course, today, Shamwari uh, Private Gaming Reserve is one of the most famous destinations in the world, you know, with staggering achievements and f- and what a phenomenal uh, project there. But I can imagine the start wasn't easy. And if I recall correctly from our conversations in London, the turning point was the 1995 Rugby World Cup. Tell us what happened and why that was such a pivotal moment. Yeah, that's a good, uh, a very good uh, question, uh, Duncan. But uh, just to give you a little bit of background to that is that, you know, a lot of people um, thought we were mad. And secondly, is that, you know, the translocation of the animals was quite something. I mean, we did the first translocation of a, of a full herd of elephant, which was included the matriarch and her whole family. And we thought we'd built a, a, what they call a boma enclosure. You have to put them in before you let them go. And she crashed that down in the first 10 hours. Uh, broke out of that, broke out of the game reserve, broke through all the farms, went through a national highway, went down to the coast with her baby and, uh, you know, did that a couple of times. And then sadly, we had to put her down because we were putting all our other stuff at risk. When we brought the lions in, 
they uh, woke up in the plane because they uh, put the weight of them uh, the wrong way around and the plane went down on the back wheel and then we didn't have enough medicine to keep them asleep. Paul was on that plane and we just got them there in time. So it was a, a journey of note. But I think your question is, how, what made it really turn around? And, you know, with um, the Rugby World Cup coming, South Africa opening up, and then, uh, you know, there were games a game played in Port Elizabeth. So we managed to get some of those top personalities that were involved in the uh, 1995 World Cup to come out and see what we had been doing. So, um, you know, uh, and we kept up a lot of those relationships that we had met those people and what they did for our country. And again, just to have those people to come out and view it and do a game drive and see what we were doing was very, very special. That's right. And of course, then, uh, and then the man to spread to, uh, as you mentioned before, to seven continents and all of that. Tell us uh, a little bit about uh, some of the experiences you offer around the world, because these are truly bucket list experiences. What can travelers see and do with Mantis? Over to you, Paul, because you've just done a trip that I was meant to be on, but I had a double knee replacement, so he just uh, chucked me off the plane and said he'll do it. <laughs> exactly. Yeah, you know, um, Duncan, I'll go back a little bit because um, uh, pre the acquisition of Accor, you know, somebody stood up in one of our conferences and they said, wow, Mantis, I mean, you guys, you can go and sip a glass of wine on top of Table Mountain and enjoy a Mantis hotel in Cape Town. You can go and do the big five at our game reserve near Port Elizabeth. You can then uh, head off to Rwanda and go and experience the gorillas. I mean, you guys are the bucket list company in tourism. And then the penny dropped. And so Dad and our team sat down. We said, you know, shouldn't we go and find um, similar prop products around the world? You know, there are beautiful lodges. There's a luxury lodge collection in Australia. Let's go and talk to them and get them on board. Let's go to... Um, Asia, you know, there's some beautiful eco lodges across right. Asia. Yeah. Let's go to Patagonia um, in, in South America. Let's go and look at um, the American ranches. They call them dude ranches, you know, where you can go and do uh, a, a cattle herding and all kinds of stuff, but then you retreat back to your lodge. And so we, we, we went on this mission and we signed up uh, properties on all six continents. And the last one that was missing was obviously Antarctica. And nobody had ever knew that there was, in fact, a lodge there. And uh, I, was, I, I wormed my way into a meeting and found out who the owners were, and I befriended them very quickly. And they have this beautiful lodge called White Desert on the seventh continent, and you fly there from Cape Town, and this is the continent, um, you know, this is the, the destination that Dad was talking about. Mm. Um, so they established uh, this White Desert Lodge um, on Antarctica. It's a only a five-hour flight from Cape Town, and you spend a week there, and you go and encounter the, the uh, emperor penguins. Um, you can go and do the actual South Pole. They take you in a charter right to the point where the South Pole is. And you do some amazing adventures there, um, in, including ice climbing. Um, I'm a runner and they said you can go on a run. So I did, they said the only place you're allowed to run is on the airstrip, which is three kilometers long. So you fly there, it's inland, this particular camp. So I was fortunate enough. It's my second time that I've got to experience it. I went 10 years ago, and then I went again now in November. It is one of the most amazing places on the planet. It really is. And to have an association there with, with those guys is brilliant. Um, and then, of course, our, our deal happened with Accor, and Accor said it's time to clean up. So let's focus on Africa. Let's focus on the Middle East, and let's, uh, you know, we'll keep the relationship with Antarctica. Um, and, and so we've we've downsized uh, um to to a point where we are we're in south america at the moment as a group we're in the uk with our london hotel we're in africa and we're still on antarctica and we've got four interesting products um, about to open in in the middle east so that's the current footprint of the group but i think the intent is with our big brother accord to go back and become the only hotel group on seven continents and that's a, a big part of our mission i think in the long term but right now we're just focusing that's right. And of course, Akko and Mantis, uh, as you both mentioned, we've been in partnership since 2018, if I remember. The first thing we did together was create the CCFA, which is the Community Conservation Fund of Africa. And the CCFA's vision, of course, is to address social, environmental imbalances and to find 
sustainable, workable solutions, you know, for this uh, global growing conservative crisis. And I know, of course, both of you are deeply passionate about this work. Paul, just uh, before I go back to Aidan, tell us a little bit about what you would do with the CCFN. Why is it so important to you, your dad, and your work? Yes, it was. I mean, it was it was amazing to to uh, sit in the the initial uh, negotiations with Accor because Dad insisted, and he put his foot down that we set up this uh, community conservation fund because, um, you know, without the community and the, um, uh, the being looked after, the animals don't benefit, and and that's kind of our our whole um, thing with the, with uh, with CCFA. You've got to look after the one to be able to look after the other. And uh, so it's a, it's a crucial part of the DNA of our group today, and um, uh, it's it's uh, us just doing what we've done for so many years, but formalising it under an organisation, having a board of trustees that can open many doors for us, and it's very much Dad's baby. Uh, he's he's driven it from the start, um, but it's got some really interesting projects in the pipeline, um, which I'm sure we'll talk about now. Uh, thank you, uh, Paul. Thank you, Duncan. Is that just to go back a little bit? Is that there were really three reasons why we did the the deal with Accor. Um, you know, as Paul said, that we had these properties all over the world, but we didn't have a distribution system, so we weren't really earning anything from uh, bookings that were being made there, and it, well, the connectivity wasn't there. So we needed a, a sophisticated uh, distribution system. The second thing that was most important to us is we didn't have a loyalty program. And that's becoming more and more popular wherever you go today, whether it be in health airlines or whatever, loyalty program. So we needed a loyalty program, which I think uh, you have one of the best. And then the third thing was, as uh, Paul alluded to, was to create the Community Conservation Fund Africa. And the A could stand for Antarctic, Arctic, America, Australia, Asia, or whatever. So it could be something that we could take worldwide. Mm -hmm. But we've got to come up with a project, which we'll talk to you about just now. But the most important thing is to work out how do we raise the money. We don't. We weren't the implementers, so we have implementers, and we prepare to support projects. But at the moment, with COVID having come on, we've decided to support and implement projects really close to our hotels. So we're getting a lot of our pro properties to get the communities involved, to grow vegetables for us, to try and supply us with day-to-day uh, uh, -day things that we need. So we've gone a, a little bit smaller, but it's still my ambition to take this to a, 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 a level that hasn't been seen in the world. And I'm very busy in America at the moment. Just to give you some, a little bit of background is that 80% of the funds that come into Africa for conservation come from America. Mm. So we want to get more involved there, and I'm busy with that right at the moment in a very big way. But um, I know that it can make a hell of a difference, not only to Mantis, but to the whole of the Aqua brand and the team to be involved with us in the Community Conservation Fund. That's fantastic. And Adrian, I understand you also have a passion and a big passion project near PE, near Port Elizabeth at the moment. And from what I hear, it's as ambitious as ever. Can you tell me a little bit about the Norsi Wildlife Reserve? Well, you know, I, I, as you say, it's quite an ambitious <laughs> project. But I, I use an example by saying I, I think New York is probably famous for Central Park, uh, London for Hyde Park, and all the cities have got some sort of park that they've got. So we came up with this idea because I've been uh, um, taking care of a property that's been owned since 1942 uh, between two big cities, in, that's Port Elizabeth, where we, we live, and Utenhag, and we've got 3,200 hectares. So I said to the guys, let's create the, the first big five game reserve between two cities. Never been done in the world before, and we can do it, but the basis of creating this project is to rewild animals. So we're going to take our first animals come in next week. They're three cheetahs. We've got all the permits. It's taken me a night and day working with the government here to get these permits in the city. Then we're going to bring in a, a breeding program for rhinos. Then we're going to bring some distressed elephants in that have been either in a circus or somewhere else. And we're going to rewild them to go to proper game reserves. And um, it's, it's really taken, it's resonated and there's, a lot of support for it. And we've broken it up 
And I must tell you is that Lord Michael Ashtroff gave me some good advice there. So we've broken it up into what we call non-profit and profit. So there's a profit element and there's a non-profit element. Now, right next to the boundary wall or the boundary fence of this game reserve is a community, a township, mm. which is to a large extent supported by the Volkswagen factory, uh, which uh, obviously is quite big in South Africa. And we want to get, so we've really given an instruction that every employee that we take there, 90% of them will be come from that township or that community. So they see the benefit of having that next door to them. It's a big project, but it's uh, it's got a lot of um, a resonation and people endorsing what we're doing there. And one of the biggest endorsers we've got there is, a, and um, it's quite interesting because zoos have a, a connotation. I, mean, I know there are a lot of bad zoos in the world, but there's some incredibly big and good zoos. For example, next week I have a delegation from Bush Gardens and SeaWorld coming to see us. You know, they're building a massive SeaWorld in Abu Dhabi. And then um, a Tusk has also got involved. But more importantly, there's a zoo outside London called Chester Zoo. It's the most visited attraction outside London, 2 million people a year. They've sent three delegations. They're about to send their fourth now to see how they can get involved in not only us taking some of their wildlife to rewild, but also to bring donors down to help us with uh, certain projects that we're going to be doing on this piece of land. And one of the big projects that we're going to be doing on this land, I don't know if you know that we started a university in South Africa 20 years ago as a franchise from the biggest hospitality university in Europe out of Holland. And we've got a campus uh, close to us at another little town called Port Alfred. And it's the only university in the world where you can do a semester in wildlife conservation. And in fact, we uh, own a small game reserve or we lease it and the students go there. So we're moving that to this property that we're redoing and in Port Elizabeth. So it's got a lot of connotations and a lot of interesting things that we will be doing there. We hope to be build the, one of the biggest um, centers, you know, where we can do research centers, where we can do not only wildlife, but we're going to do insects, we're going to do uh, plants, and we're going to do marine plus animals. And it'll be probably one of the first in the world, and we've designed it. And that's why we're getting these people to come out and look at it. So it's a massive project, but if we get it to work, I think it'll set a huge example for how we can uh, save and rewild uh, wildlife in Africa. Yeah, absolutely. And it's and it's a it's a wonderful com a combination of conserv conservation and the community. And of course, the community must be part of it, these projects. You know, it's one of the truly special important aspects of this global hospitality which we look at the integration of the community the social elevation offered by the industry to immense themselves in these locals man that's absolutely wonderful paul i understand prince william's uh, tusk trust is involved in that project and it's not your first project with the uh, tusk trust is it the, the tusk trust is one of the more established um, charities certainly for africa um, out of the UK. They are incredible and they're in America. Charlie Mayhew has been amazing to us and we've aligned very closely with them. We've so much so that we've actually, as Mantis as the hotel group, and this year Mantis and Accor are um, sponsoring the Tusk Awards, which are due to take place in November. And Prince William will be there with Kate and it's uh, it's always a, a real, a, a really wonderful evening spent with, with them. And, uh, you know, they endorse everything. He's a, he's a big fan of Africa. And I think his younger brother is too. They, mm. They're big mm. fans. And, um, you know, the hope is that one day we'll get, uh, get them out to experience Nyosi with their kids. Um, so, you know, Tusk uh, will hopefully get behind Nyosi. They've expressed a deep interest in it. Um, we just need to get them on the ground. And um, I have no doubt that they'll commit to this. And one day we'll see uh, the likes of, of Prince William um, arriving there to experience what we're doing. That's wonderful. And Paul, you've been working in partnership with Bear Grylis for the last few years. What an experience that must be. Who has <laughs> the biggest spirit of adventure, you or him? <laughs> <laughs> it's got to be me. I mean, I'll take that one yeah. away from him any day. <laughs> no, no, but seriously, it sounds fantastic. How are you working together and, and, and what are these experiences like? I mean, Bear, Bear Grylls is the face of adventure globally. You know, he's, as long as he's doing incredible things on television um it allows us to 
take what he does on TV and bring it to life for kids and adults. And we do corporate team building. So we've developed a, a product which we call location-based entertainment. And it is, again, taking what he does on TV and bringing it to life. So we don't work in television with him, but we, we work in these experiences. And the beauty of it is, is um, you know, the brand stands for getting kids back outdoors, getting them muddy, getting them, uh, you know, building tree houses and climbing trees and, you know, lighting fires, all the stuff that a lot of us grew up with, certainly in South Africa we did. Um, and, uh, and, and so much of that is taken away from kids today. They're stuck in front of their devices. So we're trying to change that. And uh, what better place to start than in the hospitality industry? So, you know, if you've got a, a, a Rixos, for instance, with um, a, a, a nice piece of land attached to it, or a Fairmont for that matter, um, you know, we should be doing a Bear Grylls activation at those, at those sites. So we're starting to talk uh, more deeply with the ACOR team about establishing those types of products around some of your more resort hotels. Uh, we've just launched our first one at Mantis Founders Lodge. So, you know, it gives the parents a good break because they can relax at the swimming pool while the kids venture down into the valley with one of our trained instructors and go and do some cool Bear grill stuff. So we can we can turn it right down to kids or we can ramp it right up to corporates that are, that want to, you know, jump out of helicopters into a lake or or um, abseil down very steep cliffs and all kinds of stuff like that. Right, right. No, Where it's true. really getting interesting now is, is Saudi Arabia. Obviously, Mantis is quite involved there. We've been looking at a few different opportunities. And wherever we go now, we pull out that ace up our sleeve, which is the Bear Grylls card. And we say, well, have you thought about attaching this to the Mantis uh, experience? And they love it. Yeah, so yeah. It's, a, it's a great calling card for us. Fantastic. And what an incredible journey you have been on together for the last 25 years or more. I mean, Adrian, you have quite a legacy there. Paul, what's it like working? What has it been like working with your dad and following in his footsteps so passionately? Well, your listeners can't see me, so they can't see the gray hair here. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's been an absolute privilege. So I get asked that question a lot, funny enough, because a lot of people can't believe that, you know, that you can have a successful working relationship with your father. It's difficult. You hear you hear horror stories. And uh, where Dad and I just get on. We click. My, brother, my younger brother, too. My sister. We are a very close family. Um, thanks to, I think, thanks to our mom. She's been the glue that's kept us all together. And, uh, you know, we're all in the industry. Um, that helps. So we exchange ideas. Christmases are fun. We talk business all the time. And um, it's been an absolute honor to have had the past, 30 odd years with working with my dad and the team behind him. Um, we've learned so much from him. Uh, so yeah, it's, uh, it's worked. It's been, it's been a good journey for me. Yeah, fantastic. And long may continue. Adrian, today purpose and action is more important than ever, especially for the employees, for the artists, and also for the consumers. People are always seeking experience just like yours. And it must be so incredibly exciting time for you and hugely rewarding to see the impact of your destinations and experiences that you're providing for the employees and the guests um you know i think uh, that's probably one of the the great things that uh, you like to see when it's sort of the end of your, towards the end of your innings and i think probably the most impactful for me has been that the number of bursaries that i've given to the university that i mentioned that we started where you've seen these kids have uh, got um, the, uh, certainly a, a enough uh, education to get a university entrance. And I've put a lot of them through that. I'm talking about disadvantaged kids. And, you know, to see the success that they've made in the hospitality industry, some of them are general managers today. A couple of them actually went to the main campus in uh, Holland and have uh, uh, grown up there. So I, I think that's where, when I see... Um, and I go into our hotels and I see some of the people that we've employed there, especially the game ranches as well, to see how their lives have changed and that they understand the importance of wildlife. They, are, they understand the importance of getting the community involved. We understand the importance of, of them having better lives than they were exposed to. So I think that making a difference is not only to, and, and we keep on saying it, not only to wildlife and that, but it's, the success of wildlife going forward is definitely going to be community-based. And I promise you, you take the wildlife out of Africa 
uh, we've got a real problem. What, what other USPs have we got besides a beautiful Cape Town and some beaches and that sort of thing, which the rest of the world has got anyway? But nobody's got the wildlife that we've got, and we have to protect it. So, you know, I think that um, it's been a privilege for me to see the lives that we've changed, and let's hope that we can continue to do it, and that's one of the legacies that, to me, is most important. That's right. And this conversation, I can assure you, has left me hugely animated and inspired, and I'm sure it will be for all our listeners too. This is what travel and hospitality can do. And I consider us all truly lucky to work in this industry, a blessed industry that enables us to live these lives and enjoy these experiences. What would you both say to somebody starting their first job in the hospitality industry about life and experiences and what they could have ahead of them? Paul and uh, and Adrian, both of you there. I mean, I think uh, I would would encourage them to jump right in. I mean, we all know hospitality is going to go through the roof in the coming years. Um, more specifically, ecotourism post-COVID. I think the world's woken up to the fact that we've got to adjust. Um, so I think there's going to be some amazing opportunities for youngsters entering the space. But, you know, wear that green cap. Keep it, keep it on you all the time. You've got to adjust and, and, uh, and, and start embracing this precious planet of ours. I've got a young girl that works for me here in the UK. She worked in finance in the city. And um, I started talking about hospitality. And she switched industries. She came and joined me. She'll never enter finance again. She absolutely loves it. She lives by it. And her whole career is now paved um, in terms of heading in that direction. So jump right in. Adrian? Yeah, from my point of view, I just see, um, you know, the people that work in the industry, whether you're, the, you know, you're cleaning the rooms or whether you're in the kitchen or whether you're at reception or whatever, the amount of people that those people meet and that they can show them the the importance of hospitality, what they're doing, and they make an impression on those people. And those people then take an interest in their lives. So it's one of the industries where you're not just sitting in an office all day. You are continually um, migrating and and seeing people, meeting people, making a difference to their lives. And as Paul says, is that we've got to wear the green cap. And just to give you a little example, and uh, the chef has really taken to it. We took up some parking areas in our small hotel and we grow our own vegetables They're in the middle of a city. And that, you know, you just cannot believe the difference it's made to the chef, the, the environment that he's working in, the enthusiasm that he has when he, you know, brings a meal out and he talks at the table and says, you know what, we grew those vegetables in an old parking area that you're eating tonight. So, you know, it's a, such an invigorating different it's the differences are so great in the hospitality uh, hospitality industry and i think particularly with regard to our brand you know where you can be in a city you can be at the university you can be at a game reserve you can really make a difference and your life will change and especially if you come and join us in this project that we're going to do can you imagine those youngsters that we're employing out there in this first ever in the world this big five game reserve between two cities yeah, I'm going to come. Forget the youngsters. I'm going to come. <laughs> Listen, I wanted to thank both of you for your time. Truly inspiring. Life's work and so much more still to come. Absolutely wonderful. What I always do at the end is uh, I have a couple of unprompted quick uh, quick fire questions. Um, and so I'm just going to pop them through to you. Just answer as quick as you can, the first words or whatever comes to your mind there. Um, and so much of what you offer, travelers, are bucket list experience. So what are your bucket list experiences, each of you? Well, I've done Antarctica and I've done the gorillas. Um, so I think for me, it would probably be, well, I actually need to go to Australia. That's on my list because that is the only continent I haven't been to. So that, I've, got to, I've got to put that on my list. Right. Adrian? I think my bucket list is that, you know, I've traveled a lot of the world. I've never been to the the Far East uh, or the Middle East. Um, I'd like to see some of the stuff that you're doing there. And I just think that some of the examples that uh, ACOR are doing in some of those hotels in the early stages, that's where I like to be involved. I like to see development. I've just got such a passion about uh, development. And if there's new developments taking place and we can in some way be involved and go and see them. Oh, fantastic. Um, <clears throat> Adrian first, if Mantis could create an experience Anywhere in the world, where would you go next? 
I've got a passion. I don't know whether it's because of rugby or what, New Zealand. Paul? Patagonia. Fantastic. Listen, uh, thank you both. It's an absolute honor to talk with both of you and really speak with you today. I thoroughly enjoyed it. I've done many of these, but I really, really enjoyed it. You have so much to offer uh, uh, to, to the industry, to the world. And we are, again, as I mentioned before, so proud to be associated with you. So, again, thank you for taking all the effort, all the time. We, we understand how busy you are, and it's really, really uh, appreciated. Thank you. Thanks for tuning in. Heart of Hospitality was hosted by Duncan O'Rourke, CEO of Accor Northern Europe. To find out more about the people that make this sector so special, visit our website and find us on Facebook and Instagram. Music